okay, this makes me feel very humble because not only have I really been reading the literature on the design of experiments, but also we've just had someone who's uh, turned them upside down and shown their shortcomings, but still I feel that medical fields are so far ahead of what happens in the social sciences that uh, we should be ashamed. And in particular, I think that management sciences should be particularly ashamed because there's a large amount of peddling of, of ideas which are fashionable, which are then uh, pushed into businesses with no empirical evidence whatsoever. And I'll discuss one example in just a moment. So what I want to do is to see whether we can't find, with the help of the, in particular, the history of technology, examples where natural experiments occurred that throw some of these theories into sharp relief. So this is about one natural experiment which took place remarkably 50 years ago, although many of the issues remain exactly the same. So excuse me walking around, but um, I'm actually an innovation researcher. That's to say I'm concerned with such basic questions as what works and what doesn't work when it comes to promoting new technology. I don't know how to answer that question, and so what I've been trying to do is to promote the use of natural experiments, and the one that I want to focus on today is why do some R&D projects succeed and why do some fail? So I want to test a distinction which is due to a former colleague of ours, a very simple distinction that he has put forward, and I'll explain, between what you might call physical technologies and social technologies. Those of you from a, a, an education or psychology or management background might spot that in the social technologies a comparison with what are sometimes called wicked problems. But my focus here is merely on whether this particular approach has legs. So we want to know what works in innovation. We want to know what doesn't and what's a waste of time when it comes to R&D. Now, clearly, the ideal, as we've just had discussed, would be some kind of randomised trial, obviously, with uh, blind assignment uh, and double-blind testing, with random assignment and double-blind testing. It's precisely, however, the nature of many of these projects that often they are just one shot. One project is selected. Just occasionally you have rival teams. Uh, for instance, uh, it would be very interesting to look back in the past where there were rival teams to develop things like nuclear bombers, but most of the time you only have one-shot experiments. Another approach has been to use statistical inference, in particular using slightly bogus indicators like patents or R&D expenditure as proxies, for instance, for innovativeness. That's resulted in a large amount of a large number of regression equations being done, which murder statistics using dodgy data. This particular institute has a strong reputation for case studies, and case studies give you a, a, a gloriously nuanced insight into what happens in a particular set of circumstances. But the difficulty there is it's very hard to abstract from context. What I want to do today is to try and find some way of extracting the effect of a particular company or a particular time or a particular technology from, uh, from the inference that we can make. So the advocacy that I'm going for here is that I want to advocate the use of natural experiments. Firstly, because we can get over this problem of context, we can isolate the particular variables of interest although I appreciate you will find this very controversial. And the second aspect of natural experiments that appeals to me is that these are for real. They are real-life situations. These are not random trials. These are not trials in the sense that you're talking to R&D managers and asking them to conduct experiments. These innovations were being implemented uh, in all earnestness. Now, clearly there is a large number of shortcomings to these kinds of experiments. Some of these are very clear. For instance, observer selection bias. You could point to me and say, 
Jonathan, you picked that because you'd been obsessed with this particular thing for 10 years and you thought it would make a nice natural experiment. What can I do? I can only plead guilty because it inevitably uh, the part of the role of the researcher to sieve out these different situations and this is perhaps only uh, the second of three or four that I've found. A more subtle problem is the fact that we're dealing with human subjects rather than drugs. And there may well be subject selection bias. Now that doesn't seem at all obvious, but if you take an organisation, this university for example, you can tell an engineer because they have rather dull dress and drive a Saab. You can tell a sociologist because they'll have an open neck shirt, jeans and trainers. You are aware that there is this kind of packing process, this kind of assortment going on in organisations, in universities, or more to the point in companies, whereby certain types of people are selected for certain types of roles. And it could be that I'm looking at a situation where the engineers now out of Innovate and were successful, and the people who are good at scheduling and managing the plant on a day-to-day -day basis, frankly, were lousy innovators. And I can't deny that. The other couple of points speak for themselves. There are very few examples. There is a clear uh, bias in history in favour of success rather than failure. We've seen that. And there's a very limited number of cases. So therefore, how can you draw any inference from one or two isolated examples? OK, this is not the first study I've attempted. I've looked at another one, which looked at an extremely fashionable theory in management, which is to suggest that in some sense, open innovation, where you collaborate with others, is better than <coughs> closed innovation, where you do it all yourself, in-house. So Dyson is closed innovation. Most modern household uh, products companies are open innovation because they're desperately trying to gather ideas from around the country. So far as I was aware, although this was an immensely fashionable theory, there was virtually no evidence other than individual case studies to show that one worked and one didn't. And what was more striking is that everyone thought this was a modern idea, when actually I was quite aware that there were examples from history where this kind of open innovation or networked innovation had taken place. So <coughs> what I did was to look at the race to develop <coughs> by Stripto in America and reconstructed this as best I could. It didn't help that... Uh, one of the companies had thrown away their archives, and went round the world, and with uh, remarkable good fortune found some of the participants not alive, but certainly uh, they didn't think that they had the archives, but they did. And um, uh, got to some very strange places. But in one way and another, the evidence seems to suggest that you can refute the null hypothesis that there is no difference between open and closed innovation. In this one case, in this one case only, I can suggest that what made the difference was networking, being open, drawing in uh, as innovation, innovation support from other companies uh, in bearings manufacture and in plant supply. The secretive company came last. Okay, so I'm looking for more natural experiments, and in this case I'm looking at a truly remarkable story, which is the computerisation of Landworm Steelworks which is a bizarre story. Why should a small publicly owned steel company in South Wales lead the world in computer control? Um, we could explore that on another day. But essentially I'm looking at two um, uh, innovations that took place there uh, uh, 50 years ago. One was looking at process control of this giant new rolling mill that you see in this artist's impression. And the other one was to look at management computers. And what I found was that the process control was effective from the start and emulated worldwide, uh, but the management computers were problematic to say the least, and I gather from my next door neighbour who runs a similar plant uh, uh, or supervises and manages, helps manage a similar plant in, in Germany, it, it still is problematic. So what we're doing is to compare two computer systems and that, of course, is a crucial source of difference. But we have at least looked at the same steelmaker, Richard Thomas and Baldwin's, at exactly the same site, the Flanwern rolling mills, with exactly the same workforce using both sets of computers. 
implemented by the same automation department led by Dennis Ray at exactly the same time. The only two things that differed were the problem that they were trying to automate and, of course, the computer and the computer suppliers. That's the, the difficulty. But even so, we could have an obvious null hypothesis that there should be no different between, difference between the two schemes. And what appealed to me was that this fitted beautifully the distinction that our former colleague Dick Nelson was making between physical technologies and social technologies. Physical technologies are very easy to understand. They're things like process control computers. They can be tested online. They can be developed in modules, as indeed this uh, uh, particular rolling mill control was. They can be tried in the laboratory. You can codify the knowledge. Everyone around it talks the same language. They can agree in engineering terms what the goals are. Social technologies are much more diffuse and open. They're much harder to define. They have to all be developed together. Uh, they're subject to a great deal of conflict. There are a large number of competing interests. They are, as we say, wicked problems. And we can summarise them. We can draw actually quite a false dichotomy for, for, for explanation reasons between these two types of technology. So a scheduling computer is a bit like trying to solve the, 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 the then contemporary problem of the ghetto in America. It works, everything works by rules of thumb. There's a large reliance on tacit knowledge. It's a bit of a black art. It's very much a hands-on intervention thing. Whereas a physical technology is a bit like a moonshot. You've either got it right technically or you haven't. It's very strongly codified. The engineers know what they're doing. So we have here an example of two computers, one pursuing a physical uh, problem and one pursuing, if you like, a social problem. But of course, I openly admit that there are some alternative explanations. It could be that the supplier of the process control computer, General Electric, was a much better supplier than Elliott Automation. There's an amusing story coming up on this. It could be that GE were a better hard hardware and software supplier and got the, their act together in time, and it could be that this was the sexier of the two projects and commanded more resources. I can't prove that. So that's one set of technical explanations, and along those lines, that's how the thing was explained at the time. But of course, we can see that technology, if you like, these computers are a mediating factor, and uh, control of a rolling mill is a much easier problem than scheduling. So it could be that it's nothing to do with the computers, rather it is inherent in the nature of some problems that they are far more difficult to adapt and fit to technology than others. Let's start talking about the computers, if nothing else, because there are some truly wonderful photos of them. This is the GE412 computer, and you can see it is clean, clinical. Look at those beautiful floor tiles. There's one isolated operator maintaining things. It's a genuine physical technology. This could indeed be part of the moonshot, except the moonshot would not have used such sophisticated computers. This was state of the art at the time. It was essentially designed, and here's the footnote from history, by a, a, a very famous parent, Steven Spielberg's dad. Okay? It was Steven Spielberg's dad who taught him how to make home movies, but he was also an ace computer designer who, after he'd finished designing the predecessor, the G312, and then this one, moved on to IBM in Los Angeles, which is how Steven could hang around the film studios. So a very nicely designed computer, but no reason to suppose that it was technically any better than the other one that you're going to look at. And so you can see that this is a physical technology. It can be drawn out in terms of beautiful diagrams, flow diagrams of processes and controls. Incidentally, this is far ahead of anything else in the world at that particular time. So it was a highly successful project. There were one thing that failed, the mill pacing had a fast the slabs go down the mill, uh, probably a software problem. And amazingly, very early computers 50 years ago were a lot more reliable because Microsoft hadn't got in on the act. Okay, so remarkably reliable hardware, software faults, 
and a significant point that managers were a bit reluctant to use them in case the, uh, in case the operators lose their skills, which does go to show that even physical technologies do get socially shaped by the people that use them. And of course, it's very much a technical routine. Um, it's uh, precisely specified. It's amenable to coding. A new workforce were very happy to adopt this technology. OK, so it was a novel problem, but it was a technical problem and thereby easy to implement. Sorry, we've, got, we've lost something here. My apologies. My apologies. I'll be back. OK, let me show you a truly glorious gendered photo. I love this collage, which was done by Richard and Thomas Baldwin, which is a Richard Thomas and Baldwin which is a You can see the women with their beehive hairdos crunching out um, paper tape for the uh, scheduling computer. And needless to say, the men are standing around uh, talking. And, uh, it's just a fantastically gendered photograph. And uh, uh, it's a total misrepresentation because at the time there were many women programmers, including the people that programmed this computer. And uh, there were many women present in the computer industry, but that was uh, uh, not reflected in the publicity of the time. But scheduling is very much a social routine. That's to say it's something of a black art whereby, and I don't want to explain the complications of preparatory schedules and intermediate schedules and final schedules and dealing with customers who don't want welds in their coil and the fact that old Fred sent you a large um, crate of malt whiskey at Christmas and therefore deserves preference or the fact that you want to keep the best quality slabs in case you get a good order for a high grade product and you'll only agree to use them at the last minute when there's no alternative. But you can begin to see that it's much more of a diffuse problem than rolling mill control. So there are all sorts of issues relating to slab supply, uh, various technical rules of thumb, such as uh, how you schedule the mill with regard to roll wear. There are issues of last minute orders and uh, issues of downgrades because you miss the quality. It's very much a staged and negotiating uh, pr process involving a large number of people, including uh, steel, steel plant managers, rolling mill managers, customers, downstream users, uh, and uh, the intervention of, uh, of, of senior management who want a, a fast pace of order for someone they play golf with. So what do we conclude from all this? And I've given you uh, uh, lots of shortcuts so we've got more time for discussion. We've looked at a very, two very radical computer schemes which altered the routines of the businesses that we're looking at. Clearly, the organisation of, of that particular company, Richard Thomas and Baldwin's at Plan Wern, needed to adapt to these uh, radical new technologies. It seems fairly clear and obvious in retrospect that the physical technology, the engineered, the in-house group, if you like, of engineers were able to manage and implement the technical scheme quite quickly and easily. What was difficult and what was problematic is trying to computerise, trying, if you like, to impose computer routines on a system, a social system of scheduling and meeting customer orders that relied a great deal on tacit knowledge, on black arts, on slights of hand, on shortcuts, and all these other social things with which we're familiar. So I've very much um, cut this account short and left out many of the subtleties, but what are its implications? Clearly, new technologies require organisational redesign. It's clearly much easier to focus organisational redesign on um, uh, where you have a group of engineers and technicians 
uh, uh, looking at a particular machine, it's much difficult to um, it's much difficult, much more difficult to um, encapsulate tacit knowledge, social routines into um, uh, computer software. Now, is it a natural experiment? It's open to you to argue it's neither natural nor an experiment. You could argue that it's nothing more than a, a glorified case study looking at two disparate uh, examples. We haven't explored the fact that, for instance, Elliott computers who supply the scheduling computer technically uh, stumbled. The software took a great deal of time to write. Well, of course it did, because it was such a wicked problem to try and encapsulate it in software. You could argue that uh, the GE programmers and the GE designers were much slicker and much more effective and wanted to get back to America. In fact, they went back to America in the same pace. Um, or, or we know that from the interviews. You can argue that my interview respondents, who were members of the automation team, were biased in their approach because they wanted to try and rationalize things after the event and try and explain to me why it had been so difficult to get the scheduling computers going when they had such spectacular success on the, uh, on the process control side with the GE computers. You can argue that the management was much more concerned with the flash technology rather than the day-to-day -day, uh, maintenance and management of, of, work, of work operations. So I openly admit that you can discuss and argue about these things. It just seems to me that unless you're willing to confront rational or uh, managerial theories with some kind of evidence, you can't begin to discriminate between those that are useful and those which work and those which aren't useful and which don't.